Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and today I'm going to be talking about armour, in particular armour used during the English Civil Wars and famously Worcestershire is known as the place where the English Civil Wars began and ended. If you think about uh, September the 23rd 1642 we have the skirmish or battle over it Poet Bridge and that sparks the Civil War. Interesting fact, if you go through the playlist, you will be able to see a Battle of Poic and you will be able to see it broken down step by step, hour by hour. And then you'll also see uh, a video that Ian edited, which uh, tells you about the whole battle from start to finish as one, uh, one, one video in its own right, really. And then famously, the English Civil War ended at Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651. And once again, we also covered that last year with individual uh, videos at different locations around the city, ending with Ian editing it into, I think it was about an hour long uh, YouTube video. So do have a look for those. Now, we're gonna concentrate today on English Civil War armor, but specifically that worn by the cavalry by the time we get to that war in 1642. I say that specifically because <laughs> If you look at the earlier phase of the English, uh, or the earlier phase of the 17th century, there was a lot of armour around used by mounted troops. In other words, you would see people looking very much like knights. And if you look at the Tudor or the medieval period, you will see people wearing uh, a full harness, a full set of armour going from their top to their bottoms, literally from their head to their toe. Now, by the time of the English Civil War, we're really talking about the middle of the 17th century as such. Um, armour was slowly uh, disappearing off the battlefield, really. And that was really down to the fact that soldiers had to provide their own armour to start with, just like their weapons in, in ammunition, for example, for a musketeer. But also the fact that firearms were becoming increasingly common on battlefields now. And therefore, uh, weapon development increased. Uh, muskets became more accurate then became more deadly and slowly armor was not working as good and that's the same reason in a way for the decline of the castle as such really and i'm talking about the stone castle not later fortifications and therefore when you look at cannons cannons were destroying stonework so slowly castles go out of use and we start to look for new things so one of the best reference books, I think, for anything to do with 17th century armour, or armour specifically for the English Civil War, has to be this one called Arms and Armour. And I've used it a few times in these videos. I know when we did a video on Pikeman's Armour, for example, uh, I used that book then. And it's a really good one. Uh, David Blackmore wrote it, and it's quite an old book now. Uh, and it was produced by the Royal Armouries. And this was when there was quite a large collection also at Little Cot House. Unfortunately, that's now a hotel, I believe. Um, but when I visited there uh, in the 1990s, I think it was about 1993, 1994, uh, Little Cot House was full of armour at that point, uh, just like uh, the other collections, for example, owned by the Tower Armouries. So uh, Civil War armour, for the cavalry specifically is what I want to talk about. And technically, there are three standard types of cavalry as such. And if you look back at the playlist, when we, uh, when I take out my uh, war games figures, I, I went into them in a bit more detail. So we've got the cuirassier, the harquebusier, and dragoons. Well, dragoons are nothing more than mounted musketeers, so no armour whatsoever. And cuirassier is the other extreme. And that's what I said at the very, very start. These were the people that were dressed very much like medieval knights. And these wore armour from the top of their head down to about their knee, really. Uh, and these were heavy cavalry and they were in decline anyway. And one of the main uh, units in the Civil War, one of the most famous units of the Civil War of cuirassier has to be, has to be uh, Arthur Hesselrig, who formed a cuirassier uh, unit. Uh, and they were often nicknamed Hesselrig's lobsters because they looked like a lobster. Now we're concentrating on what's known as the Harkabusier or what we would now call light cavalry. And you will see from this book 
uh, we have a picture of the armour and this set down here is actually a set that was on display at Little Cot House and as I said that's now a hotel or I believe it still is a hotel. Now light cavalry only wore a small amount of armour and famously the first thing that they actually wore was the helmet and they look like these. Now these are all replica. We always use replicas until we get really to the 19th and 20th century and then we can use originals. Uh, this is a replica of a cavalry helmet. Now years ago we always used to believe that this was worn by the roundheads, the parliamentarians, and it was the cavaliers, the royalists, that wore big floppy hats with feathers. However, this was actually something that was worn by both sides. So you would find mounted troops, cavalry, the arquebusier, wearing these type of helmets, be it parliamentarian or royalist. And they give a lot of protection. Like most helmets, like the pipeman's helmet, they're always rounded and therefore anything hitting the top of it or coming from the front or the back or the side would hopefully be glanced away from the important stuff inside, for example, the flesh and the bone. There is usually a central ridge running on top. This strengthens the helmet, something that was put into a lot of helmets in the past also. And obviously we've got the cheek pieces that are designed to protect your sides of your face from sword cuts. But the most obvious thing about this is we have a visor of some description really. Sometimes these had one bar on, other times they have the three, which is why this helmet is technically known as a tri-bar pot, sometimes referred to also as a lobster tail helmet, and that's really down to the fact that the tail on it resembles the tail of a lobster. Interesting fact though, during the 17th century, during the Civil War, it was usually referred to as the tri-bar pot. The bars at the front there do actually protect the face from sword cuts. Nothing's really going to go in. You'd be very unlucky to have something go in. Uh, if you look at cavalry, they're mainly slashing. So these helmets do protect the face. There's sometimes a little hook at the bottom preventing uh, the swords from sliding down and cutting into the chin. And obviously these could be pulled up and brought down when required. If you want to drink, you pull it up and obviously slide it down when you're about to go into combat. But as I said, they're often referred to as uh, lobster pots and that's really down to the fact that we have this articulated tail on it just of here. Funny thing is though, the main name was a tri-bar pot or often referred to as a pot helmet. The little uh, device at the back there, very much like what you have on Roman helmets, can also be found on uh, pikemen's helmets as well, are often used for things like twigs. In other words, when soldiers went into battle to try and distinguish friend from foe, they often wore what was often called a field sign. And this could be a sprig of holly, a sprig of oak, uh, maybe even a bit of cloth tied in there. And it was the only real way of telling who's who during the Civil War, really, deep down. Yes, officers wore sashes, for example, a red or rose pink one for the Royalist or even the New Model Army later on in the war. Uh, and predominantly orange or tawny, orange or yellow was used by the parliamentarians. But really, when it came to the average soldier, it was very difficult to tell who's who. So this is the first thing that cavalry troopers wore in the Harkaboussier. Remember, that's what we're concentrating on, the light cavalry. And these gave a lot of protection for the head from sword cuts and to a certain degree pistol bullets and uh, the odd uh, musket ball from a long distance for example. The next thing was the body armour and it consists of two parts so you have at the front there what's known as a breastplate and one of the most uh, obvious things you will notice straight away is it's a different shape to what the pikeman wore. Pikeman's armour tends to have a flat bottom to it uh, that's because they're marching around on foot. Whereas if you think about uh, the seating position, you need it not to cut into the legs. And if it was flat at the bottom, every time you bounced up and down on a horse, this thing will be constantly hitting you in the throat. So it has to be shaped like that. So it sits on the body perfectly when sat down. Um, you'll also notice it's much shorter. Pikeman's armour will come down a little bit lower than the waist, whereas these are high. And once again, that's to enable the cavalry trooper to literally sit on a horse and still be able to manoeuvre really. These two little studs either side on the left and right was used so the back plate could be attached. Now whereas pikeman's armour is always shown with a tiny little hook so you put it on the push the strap over and push the hook in to hold it together. These had what is often referred to as a keyhole 
uh, locking mechanism. So you push it over and the weight of the armor actually locks it in place. Quite a clever uh, system really. And it means that you don't have to fiddle about with hooks or anything like that. And it does hold it secure. And you will see that in original ones as well. The other thing about original armor is on the neck piece, I don't know if you can see that on there, uh, you usually had the maker's stamp on there. Uh, and on this replica one, uh, we've had the maker's stamp also marked on there so you can actually see it. So as we always say, we have replicas for uh, earlier periods in history, but we always like to have very accurate uh, copies of those items, even down to the little detail such as the maker's mark. Now, some people may be sat there now thinking, well, there's no dent, there's no proof mark on the breastplate. And that's down to the fact that some armour, and I do say some armour, was tested. In other words, they would place it against a tree or even on a stand and they would shoot a pistol ball at it and that would leave a dent. And in a way, it was like a, a safety mark saying this one works against shot. The interesting thing is, however, not all breastplates, cavalry breastplates, the Harkabusier breastplates were actually tested in that way. So my copy doesn't have one and in a way that helps me because I often talk about it and say not all of them had them and we definitely know not all of them did. So really it was the tri-bar pot on the head and a backing breastplate that protected the main parts of the body and in this book here the one by the tower armories you do actually see the original ones in here and like I said uh, you will see on this one here where we have that keyhole locking device and you also see on this one we even have the bullet mark which is the proof mark but like I said not all of them did. Now in the earlier part of the 17th century um, usually there was also something known as a buff coat worn underneath. Now I've only brought my metal armour in whereas in my store I do actually have a, a buff coat as well and it was basically a leather coat and these were often especially in the early part of the 17th century as I said uh, was often worn underneath the armour and in a way it acted as padding and these also survived. There we go we have a buff coat there. By the time the Civil War breaks out, really the vast majority of cavalry were wearing those tri-bar pots and a backing breastplate, basically. That was the norm for most people. Some actually wore what was called a bridal gauntlet, and I actually have one just of here. And it basically fitted to the left forearm, and it didn't just cover the hand, but it actually came right up to the elbow. And this one, authentically, has a tiny little leather strap which is designed to button up to the buff coat if it was being worn. And it's interesting because when cavalry slowly developed to be uh, tanks, for example, it's interesting how tanks are often marked by uh, what is technically an armoured fist. And it really comes from this, the cavalry becoming slowly over time uh, tank units later on uh, in history, really. So that's what the cavalry wore, and that's what we know the cavalry wore at the uh, skirmish at Poet Bridge in 1642. And we also know that they were wearing that by 1651 as well. However, by 1651, half of them weren't even wear back in breastplates because, as I said, as the war went on, as the 17th century went on, the armour was slowly disappearing. So hopefully, this has been a nice introduction to what the cavalry wore for protection. The only thing you haven't seen uh, that I own is my buff coat, but maybe I'll talk about that separately on another video. So stay safe and uh, stay indoors and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.